Grayling Butterfly Training. My name is Daniel Banks. I'm the Citizen Science Officer, so I do all of the Citizen Science projects in the Trust, and we're looking at Grayling Butterflies today. Um, I just want to give you some background on why we're looking at Grayling Butterflies. So we're going to record the Grayling, and we're looking at potential suitable habitats, because this is part of a bigger project, which is called the Heathlands Connections Project. And the idea, of a time, but the idea with the Heathlands Connections is we want to connect all of our fragmented Heathlands together. And the way we can do that is by engaging with landowners and looking at certain species that might be living on those habitats. So the grayling is a really good example of this because it likes those Heathland habitats. So we can start looking at um, populations of that species. We also looked at earlier on the year nightingales, um, and that's because when we're connecting those heathlands, we're not going to connect them with more heathlands, we're going to connect them with different habitats, and the nightingale really enjoys um, scrub habitat, and that's quite a common habitat between these places. So we would use the scrub to encourage the landowners to encourage nightingales, which would make that habitat better. Um, so it's a really, really cool project. It's going to um, connect a lot of land together, which will help with the 30 by 30 targets that we've got set, um, which is to make 30% of land and sea suitable and safe for nature. So it's really, really interesting. And having these poster species to do that is really good as well. So how are we going to survey? Well, you've already downloaded Survey123, so that's excellent. Um, and you've got it open. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to escape from this and we're going to go through the survey on the screen. Hopefully that has come up behind me, yes. So we're monitoring the presence of grayling butterflies in sites across Surrey. Um, and I'll show you where we want to look at those sites a bit later on, but you've got the survey open, haven't you? So you're going to put your full name in first, and that's really important because if you go to a site and you tell me that you found a thousand grayling and, I, and you put in a name that I don't recognise, I'm not going to be able to find you on the system. Um, say for, my name's Dan, say for example there's 20 Dans doing these surveys and each one puts Dan, I'm never going to know which Dan it is to find. So your full name is really, really useful for us because then I can contact you and go, did you find a thousand graylings? If so, I want to come out and I want to have a look at a thousand graylings. Um, the date will automatically infill for you and then you'll do a pin. So you can click on the map and that will drop a pin where you are. So you can see on the map right now we're in. Actually, this is actually in Brookwood Cemetery, I think. Not quite levelled, but we're in the area. I think if I was to press that button, it might actually. But no, it's telling us we're in Brookwood Cemetery. Oh, well, but it will tell you where you are. And if we had seen a grayling, we would drop a pin. So. If we have got that, we then put how many grayling we count, and you can see the number button there will tell you what number to put in. So it might be one, two, three, four, five, whatever. Um, it's going to ask you if it's a male or female as well, or unknown. I'll go through that a little bit later in the PowerPoint, showing you what the male and female, how to tell the difference is. But if you're not sure, you can put unknown, and that's not a problem. And then their behaviour as well. So graylings are quite active when you see them. So they might be feeding, they might be resting, they might be courting, they might be fighting. So just an information box to say what they're doing is really, really useful. And then habitat again. So we're asking for the habitat. This is completely subjective to your feeling when you're out there, but you've got options of scrub, woodland, woodland edge, grassland, urban, heathland, agriculture, and other. If you click the other box, it will load a text box for you to put that in. Um, Graylings are quite synonymous with heathland habitats, so if you are finding them in other areas, that will be interesting, but they're most likely to be found on the heathland, I would imagine. We're also going to ask you to do um, some grass identification for this one, if you can. Um, so grayling, as a butterfly, it uses grasses to lay its eggs and its caterpillars on. There are five species it likes to use. We have made a document to show you how to identify those species, which I will email to you after this training. 
it's not a red starred question. So if you can't do the grass species, it's not the end of the world, but it's just a little bit of extra learning. If we've got grayling butterfly, we want to know that there is those host plants there to be able to continue that breeding cycle as well. So if you can see those, then you would mark them off, but I'll go through those a little bit later on. Um, Bare ground coverage is being asked for. So you've got the nice different percentages here. The reason we're asking for this is because graylings love bare ground. They love to sun themselves on the bare ground. So if you're in the area, you're going to mark how much bare ground there is. You've also got a condition assessment. Again, this is quite subjective. So you're going to say poor, fairly poor, moderate, fairly good or good. Um, if you're out on one of our exquisite heaths, you're probably going to say that it's good condition. But if you're in a more scrubby kind of area or something like that it may not be and if you're not seeing any host plants either that could basically make that habitat not good for graylings you've got management issues so you do scrub clearance grazing pollution slash litter burning fire damage you might get quite a bit of burning on the heathlands if you're there you might be able to see the scarring and urban encroachment and other and then we've also got other taxa. So we've got this little box at the bottom and you are able to take photos. You can take a picture of your grayling if you want, or you can take photos of other species that you find. And with this one, so when we did the nightingale survey, we marked an area and did everything in that survey. If you're out walking and you've got your grayling here and you're dropping your pit point for your grayling, it's just species that are in a 10 meter area around that grayling. So there's no point in saying, oh, I can see right off in the distance a red kite. I'm going to record that. That's not what we want from this. We just want the species in the area. So you might have grayling flittering around. You might also have silver studded blue, for example, flittering around. So you could record that butterfly. You could record other plants in the area. There's a really, really good plant called marsh gentian, which is found on the heathlands. You might be near a, a, a bunch of that. So it's only in that 10 metre rough area of where you've dropped your pin. Um, not wildlife that's all the way up on the other hill or something like that. The reason we're doing it slightly differently is just to see how that works against the nightingale survey, because the nightingale survey did record 80 other taxa, which is really, really good. It got things like um cuckoo and turtle dove which is really really great but also it's locating where those species are so we're going to try it this way see if it's a bit different see if people are still able to record and the other reason we want you to record other taxa is to just get into that habit of doing it because this project is going to be engaging with landowners it will be new areas of land that will be that may not have been surveyed before so if you're starting to get your eye in on other taxa as well that's really really useful going forward because then you can also um, record other things and we can build a plan of what that habitat has potentially got so it's really really useful and then you've got your submit button at the bottom. Please, every time you do a survey, press that so that we've got that record because sometimes they, they disappear. So that is kind of the survey technique. What you're going to do, it's very, it's very simple. It's, it's more, please do make special trips if you want to, but if you're just out and about on the Heathlands, then you can just drop your pin and record. Um, so visiting anywhere with existing grayling sightings in Surrey, so that is basically this belt on the western side of the county. The Heathlands connection is around the Waverley slash Guildford area down here where you've got things like Puttenham Common. Um, so they're really, really good sites to go to to get for the Heathlands connection. But also I'm fully aware that some people may just be really interested in wanting to see a grayling. So other than helping out of the project. So if you are one of those people, then the Chobham area is really, really good for um, grayling. It's obviously not part of the Heathlands connection, but if you're out and about people coming from different parts of the county, they might not be able to get all the way over here. Then if you're up here, you can also do a pin as well. Any data is excellent data. But if it's for the Heathlands Connections program, we want it down here in the Waverley Guildford area where we're hoping to connect all those Heathlands up. So you have to record them by sight. You can't just go there and go, I'm assuming they're a grayling here because there might not be. They are a red listed species. 
so numbers fluctuate um, and it's really important that we do record them because of that because if we're not recording a red listed species and it suddenly disappears then we're in trouble so you must see them um, and then if you see one you're standing there drop your pin and then that pin drops and we know that there was at least one grayling there and as I said you can record other species within a 10 meter radius of the original sighting um, so that might be just in the area around you. You've got habitat and distribution here of the grayling. Now, if you know anything about graylings, you'll see that most of the habitat and distribution is around the coastline. That's not really where they should be. It's just be where they've ended up because that is an area that's not as badly damaged for them. They do use something called marum grass, which is found on our sand dunes. But when I've been reading up about them, one of their adult food plants is something called yellow wart, which actually is found on chalk grassland. So historically, they could have been around on the chalk grasslands, which we've got lots of in Surrey. But they're just now confined to our heathlands. And you can see here that the red means that there's at least 10 plus seen. And so that data is showing that they are there, but not in the rest of the county, really. So we need to look into why that might be. And then I have got a county map here. So this is a distribution in Surrey. As I said, historically, this is taken from the Surrey Biodiversity Information Centre. Chobham is where they're thriving. That is their strongest population. But there is a good population down here, which is what we're kind of looking for in this Heathlands project. So if we get some more sightings around here, that's really good. Last year on Puttenham Common, we recorded it for the Space for Nature project, which was great because I don't think it had been recorded there for about five or six years. So they are around. It's just getting those people on the ground to have a look at it. There are two random sightings in the middle of the county as well, which are interesting because I don't think there's Heathland around there. So they're on a different habitat. So, as I said, if you live right down here in the county and you happen to find a grayling, please do pin it because it will bring up more distribution for us. But this is the area we're kind of really interested in. So, as a butterfly, and this is going to be very mean of me, it's not the most prettiest butterfly that you can find out there. It is what we call in the birding world a little brown job. Um, but there are some identification features which help us to identify this butterfly. There are some confusion species which I will go through as well. But what you're looking for is these eye spots. So what you're mostly going to see is the grayling with the closed wing here, but the eye spot is on show. This is a defense mechanism because when they see you, they're going to think that you're a threat predator. So they're going to close their wings, camouflage in with the color and just show the eye spot, which if a predator is to go for it, will go for that spot, therefore not harming the body, just grabbing the wing, which a butterfly can cope if its wing is slightly jaded or damaged, so it can float off into the distance and get away. But apart from that, you're looking, again, like I said, it's a brown butterfly, but they do have these orange flecks at the bottom here, but they're not going to be, you're not going to really see them in flight or open winged. It's, very, it's quite rare to see them in that. It's more likely you're going to see them with the closed wing. And I have put the caterpillar on here, which again is just another brown standard caterpillar, because if we're looking at food plants, there's a chance for you to have a rummage on the food plants very gently and see if you can see the caterpillar nibbling on those grasses. And if you've got it in a life stage like this, then that's really good as well, because we can say we've actually got some breeding caterpillar as well, um, which is really, really good because Butterflies do fly, they do move quite good distances, and there could be that a butterfly is in an area but not showing any breeding evidence. And so is that really worth shouting about that a butterfly might be passing through? Whereas if we've got that breeding evidence, we can say they're using this site and they're staying there. So that's quite important. So just very quickly, we're going to have a look at the male and the female. And as I said, they'll land on the ground and they'll close their wings. And when their wings are closed, that is how you can tell the difference between male and female. This is the male. This is the female. And the difference is really subtle. It's this white stripe going down here. So you can, when they're next to each other, you can see a slight difference. 
but it's hard to do. So if you are out in the field and you can't do it, you have that unknown, you can put unknown. But if you can work it out, that's also really useful because if we're at a site and we're just recording male graylings, that's also not really great for us because if there are no females around, then there's no breeding potential. So yes, that is your hard, it's a hard thing to do. It's probably one of the hardest things I've read about graylings, but you're looking for that prominent white stripe down the male on the right hand side here and the female who doesn't really have as much of a prominent white stripe on the left hand side. The male's wing is slightly darker as well, which probably brings that stripe up a bit more as well compared to the female who is a little bit duller. Um, but that is your only difference. They don't differ in size. They don't differ in speed or anything like that. That's the only way to tell the male and female apart. So we have our confusion species as well. Um, so butterfly conservation will say that there's six confusion species. The good news is that really only three of them exist in Surrey, so we don't have to look at the other three. The other three are the large heath, which is extinct in Surrey, the wall butterfly, which occasionally turns up, and speckled wood. Speckled wood does look a bit similar. However, it is a woodland species and grayling doesn't go in woodlands. So we can kind of rule speckled wood out as a confusion species because it's not going to be in the same area that our grayling butterflies are in. However, these three are all probably going to be in the same area. So the first one is small heath. Small heath is tiny compared to the grayling. Grayling is about double the size. And the way you tell the difference is that the small heath is completely orange on its wings. So if its wings are open, that's going to be a bright orange that you're going to be able to see. It also doesn't have the lines and the, um, if I go back, the mottled patterning on the wings like the grayling does as well. It is just for the um, small heath, it's just a little bit of brown and a little bit of fluff. So I think out of the three confusion species, this one is slightly easier to not get confused with. The one that it probably is going to get confused with is the meadow brown in the middle here. And meadow brown are similar size to grayling, a little bit bigger. And I would say they more kind of when they fly, it's kind of like a oh, fly, like here I go flittering around. Whereas the grayling is a stronger flyer. It's more purposeful when it flies. So if you see a butterfly that's kind of like, oh, I'm giving up, I'm going to not fly anymore, then it's more likely to be a meadow brown. You have the eyes again on the meadow brown, but it only has one, whereas grayling has three on the main wing. And there is a patch of orange, but the patch of orange on the meadow brown is on the top wing compared to the grayling, which is on the bottom wing. So yes, they are a confusion species. Meadow brown will inhabit the heathlands because it also inhabits the grasslands as well, and it's a very common butterfly. However, again, closed wing, there's going to be none of that mottled brown effect. It's just going to be pure brown on the meadow brown. Um, so I think this one could be your real confusion species, but you do have that camera option. So if the butterflies have rested and settled, you could take a picture of it, add it to your survey. We'll see that survey result. And if you go, oh, I'm not so sure, then someone will look at it and they might go, actually, you've recorded a meadow brown as opposed to a grayling. We're here to help you. You're not on your own with this. So if you want to have a go, please do. And if it works, grayling, excellent. If it's meadow brown, excellent. They're all still records and we will be able to work it out. You've also got gatekeeper on the end here. So gatekeeper, slightly different. It's a bit smaller than grayling again, much more orange on the top and the bottom wing. The eye spot is there, but as you can see, there are two white dots in its eye spot as opposed to the grayling which has the one up here. So that's kind of your other defining technique. Um, and also it's not as brown as the other two with that more orangey color as well. And I think when the wings are closed, there's not a mottled um, pattern either. 
gatekeeper is quite common butterfly but this year doesn't seem to be that common i haven't seen one this year so whether or not their numbers are struggling a little bit i don't know um maybe due to the cold summer spring and summer we're having gatekeepers just not around at the moment um so it will be interesting if you are recording other tax so you do see gatekeeper pop it in there because it, it would be interesting to know so here are the food plants of the grayling so you've got sheep's fescue red fescue bristle bent and early hair grass are the four main ones um they're all grasses, which is all fun and games because grasses are fun and games. Um, so this sheet will give you some information on those species, but and there are some pictures as well. Um, what you're looking for with things like uh, sheep's fescue is thin needle like leaves um, and they form dense tufts and clumps, which is quite common in a lot of these grass species they are quite clumpy which is why the grayling likes them because there's plenty of space for it to lay its eggs and for the caterpillars to to thrive on um, they're all associated with heathland and they're all associated with dry grasslands as well um, red fescue the clue is slightly in the name there's a red tinge to it so you can have a little look and, and look at the grass and you might be able to see that they're much it's much larger than uh, sheep's fescue as well so you can look between those and like i said the red pink spikelet spikelets um it's low lying and less tussocky than sheep's fescue but still does form a tussock um and then bristle bent bristle bents are quite easy to look at because in the stem they bend the clue is in the name bent um they have thin hair-like leaves and they form nice tussocks again and then you've got early hair grass early hair grass is really small it's only about that big so again it might not be as easy to see but you're looking for tiny little areas of that um and they turn red the leaves at the end of the season so it might actually be turning red now because it's slightly earlier grass you've also got tufted hair grass and you've got marron grass we won't be finding marron grass because we don't have any sand dunes around here but tufted hair grass could be on the heathlands as well so you might find that it's only occasionally used the other four species are more preferred so if you do find tufted hair grass and you find uh, grayling on it excellent but it's more likely that that's not going to be a plant that we need to really look at so we've spoken about other species on this survey like i said butterflies we want you to record any other butterflies you see there is silver studded blue i've had a conversation with butterfly conversation con conservation about silver studded blue they're quite interested in records this year so if you do find one please do add it in and what we will do is we will share that data with butterfly conservation so that they have got that as well because they're quite interested in that other flowering plants i've mentioned about marsh gentian marsh gentian can only be found on chobham common but that's not to say that it's not somewhere on a heathland that we don't really know about or in an area that you guys might be walking um, and you can do a, you can mention that you've got marsh gentian there as well. Other insects, there's things like tiger beetles, which are quite rare, heath tiger beetles. You might be standing there and one may run across you very, very quickly. You can say, I've got a tiger beetle as well. That's another rare insect that, again, that record is used for. You've got, ma I've put mammals on here, which would be a bit harder in a 10 square kilometre, but you might be standing there and you might, if you're good at your field signs or your track and field signs, you might see that a roe deer has walked across where you're standing and you can say roe deer footprints, for example, or something like that. It's looking at the air and the small area you're in and just making a note of other things that might be there. You could do birds, but birds are most likely to be far away. But that's not to say you might be standing next to a tree and there might be a chiff chaff singing its head off or a willow warbler. And if you can identify that call, you could also add a bird in there. You could do fungi if you're any good at fungi. Anything, anything that you can ID just helps build that picture, which is really, really important. Um, 
because there's only a couple of us today, I have rather flown through this PowerPoint and this is actually the last slide. <laughs> Um, probably the most interesting slide of the whole PowerPoint not. It's the health and safety slide. And it's just important to know, you might already be aware of the loan working policy um, that will be sent out to you. And it's important that you adhere to that. If you're going out on site, please let someone at home know or a neighbour just that you're going out and then when you're coming back as well and how long you're going to be out for. Um, I can't be your loan working buddy because I have two to three hundred volunteers and I'd be spending most of my time taking loan working phone calls. So it has to be someone at home, which is really, really helpful. Just takes that away from me. Be aware that you might be on a hillside as well. Um, Surrey does have hills, although the Heathlands are fairly flat, so it should be OK. But with that, be aware that we've got changeable weather. We haven't really had a summer. There is some predictions that late July, early August could turn into a summer. That is peak time for grayling. That's when they're all out and about. So you may be working in quite warm conditions um, and there probably won't be any shade because, like I said, these butterflies, they enjoy basking. They enjoy being in the sun. So you're not going to be in a shaded area. So if you are out and about, please be aware of the sun. Have uh, sun cream, plenty of water. And if you are feeling hot and bothered after a survey, just go and spend some time in the shade to cool down. But also be aware that we could suddenly have a storm or a thunderstorm or rain. I mean, you can be out on a heathland and sometimes you can have all four seasons in a day. It is crazy. And we are going to carry on into September for this survey as well. So there is a chance that September could cool off and there could be a chance that there might be some thunderstorms or whatever just be aware of that and if you are on a heathland for example the land is completely open those thunderstorms are super impressive but just be aware that they're there please be aware of rabbit holes as well although if you're on the paths it should be okay but you might see a grayling flittering on a field somewhere you might wander out just be aware there are plenty of rabbits around rabbit holes can be ankle breakers so just keep an eye on them and then please also keep an eye on ticks uh, we've got plenty of deer on sites. We've got cows on sites now, hedgehogs, foxes, all of those creatures carry ticks and the grasses will be quite long. Um, so if you are out surveying, just do a tick check when you get home. If you find a freckle that's on your arm or on your leg, please remove it by using a tick twister or tweezers. Tick twisters are quite easy to buy on Amazon. They're two to three pounds take it off but please whatever you do don't use lotions potions naked flames anything just don't use those adhere to the rules and if you do get a rash that looks like a bullseye and you're feeling poorly after about two weeks please do consult your doctor because there's a chance you will need antibiotics <laughs>